Journalism is live and kicking here at the Jerusalem Press Club. And today with us is Dr. Joseph Joffe, publisher editor of the German weekly Die Zeit. Thank you very much for joining us. It's a pleasure, even though it's much earlier for me than for you. <laughs> uh, Dr. Joffe, before we dive into journalism, I'd like to start with the coronavirus um, uh, in Germany. Uh, obviously, as journalists, we are preoccupied with this everywhere. Uh, from the outside, it looked as if the uh, uh, German government or Germany um, has been very successful in, in dealing with this. But now there's a big new spike coming. What happened? I think it's the same thing happened that happened everywhere, especially in Israel. You, uh, you put the lid on the pot, as in Israel, very hard. The cases go down, then you lift the lid, and then people uh, become um, incautious, shall we put it, and uh, engage in risk-taking, and, um, and the case numbers rise. In, in, same in Germany, only only at a much lower level. We never had the kind of harsh lockdown that you had in Israel. But apparently something happens in the course of, of the quarantining or whatever you want to call it. People become impatient, and especially young people, who, as you know, are more uh, dependent on, shall we put it, social intercourse, call it parties, drinking, uh, dating, who think statistically that they are immortal, and so they gather in large crowds, and so we have the rising numbers. And you have the same in Israel, but I think compounded. Maybe Germans are a bit more disciplined than Israelis. Uh, well, they should, according to the perception, because here in Israel, they always say, hey, it's not Germany here. Look at the Germans. Yeah. They're so disciplined. <laughs> Everything is so well organized. So, no, it's it, not. You're telling me it's the same? <clears throat> I disagree. <clears throat> that's, a tr that's a traditional view of Germany. This is a federal country with 16 states where health policy is down to the level of the locality and the state. You have a lot of experimentation going on. You find out best practice. They are not being German as we think they are or used to be. They, I think they, they trust government. And so they do the right thing. Like where, I mean, you, I go out in the streets and there's nobody without masks. And there's no uh, Gestapo out there to force them. Maybe they've become more reasonable in the past. And yeah, maybe and the, 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 Israelis the German government crazy. requested the people, the public, to stay at home, right, as much as possible. But it, this was just a request. Not Did it here. work? No, 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 no. The, the country is still at the point, at, still at the point, it may change tomorrow, where you can move around freely, uh, uh, wear masks where you are in, in, say, in the subway or in the store. And the only harsh, the, the real harsh, um, rule is no gathering above so and so many people at a time. And restaurants keep tables apart. So, so far that's been working, but as you noticed, the case numbers go up drastically. So whatever I say today may be um, uh, obsolete tomorrow. Right. Uh, and, and to the point of the trust, I'm, I'm curious, what, what's the level of the government trust in Germany? I think, it's a, I think that makes a big difference between, call it maybe the northern Protestant countries uh, and the rest, uh, yes, I'd say from Sweden down to Switzerland. High level of social trust and a high level of trust in the government. It may break again tomorrow, but that to me, um, th that strikes me as a, as a critical difference between what I call the Protestant North and the rest of the world from Catholics to, to Jews. The virus uh, brought out some really ugly stuff, including anti-Semitism, of course. Do you see this in Germany? More anti-Semitism on, on this breakaround? Look, there is a surge in anti-Semitism 
open manifest anti-Semitism throughout the Western world. I'm not even don't even want to talk about the Arab the Arab uh, world. Um, it has very little or nothing to do with COVID because that surge precedes, precedes COVID. I don't see any causal connection. Uh, we can now spend the rest of our time on the, on the, on the question, why anti-Semitism, why, why now? You know, you might go for easy answers like economic deprivation leads to anti-Semitism. I don't think so. I, uh, I don't think it's the economics, it's um, cultural psychology. Too much, of a, too much of a field to cover, except I would say there is COVID and anti-Semitism. I don't see a connection. It's enough, you, know, you don't need COVID, that's what I'm trying to say. Right, it's there anyway. Now, um, the site is known for its uh, serious journalism and, and lengthy articles and fact-checking, all the good stuff that we journalists are yearning for. Yeah. How do you get people's attention these days with this kind of journalism? That is a very critical question, uh, the, the question. You take a serious paper, quote unquote, like uh, Die Zeit, or the New York Times, or the Guardian, or uh, uh, I don't know, Haaretz, um, and if you compare them, today's version to say 20, 30 years ago, they have become much less serious, meaning much more color, much, more, much bigger pictures, much bigger headlines, and above all, I think the content has changed from the political to the personal. So I think throughout the world, uh, you have emphasis on, let's say, trying to explain what is going on in Iraq by uh, looking at uh, Mahmoud and Mariam. And trying to personalize a problem which is military, strategic, economic, um, battle between tribes and faiths and all that kind of stuff. That I think is true for, for, for the entire world. Um, and apparently we all believe that we cannot lure our audience with the kind of classic analytic stuff, he said, she said, uh, numbers, etc. The only difference, I think, the only exception to this, which we all know, is the economist. The economist is still not about personal stuff, not about anecdotes, not about uh, drama of people, but numbers, statistics, etc. Quotes. So with you know social networks and um and politicians screaming fake news and stuff like that will serious journalism survive or how could it survive if i don't know you know it depends on our our politics who we call serious but say if you if you if you say the new york times is serious it's a serious paper I have my problems with it because it has moved into, into, into politics as have all as the post and so on. But it is a serious paper and that serious paper as others like the post in America have experienced enormous surges in, in, in circulation and readership. If you ask me why, I think uh, Donald Trump is the most sim is the simplest answer. We make a lot of hay on this enormously entertaining, both entertaining and fearful, and some would say pathological figure. He is the most entertaining figure in my lifetime. Certainly more entertaining than was than is Angela Merkel <laughs> or, or Joseph Stalin. Okay. Um, so, um, so there is serious journalism, obviously. 
I'm not also I'm just add something. I don't just because our photographs have become larger and the personal personalizations have become uh, more frequent, doesn't mean we've stopped being serious. I mean, we still look at facts and we try to analyze them and connect them and try to explain, et cetera. But to come back to your question, <laughs> we have, in terms of entertainment, we have enormous competition from the social networks. You know, people, I just read a number about the United States, you know, America's on average spend six hours a day on social media. They don't spend six hours on Yediot Achonot or Haaretz, do they? No, I doubt <laughs> it. So I, I, that, that's my question again. Um, will journalism uh, be able to uh, confront this on the long run? You see, there, there's a new generation of readers and journalists who yeah. grew up with social networks already. Yeah. And uh, how, how do you cope with that? How did Said cope with that? Okay, here's, the, here's a standard answer, which is not that, that bad, I think. You might call it a paradox. So you have a couple of billion people around the world who use the social networks where they are overwhelmed uh, by, by bits and pieces, bits and bytes. That creates a counter, you know, kind of the, <laughs> we, when we were young Marxists, and when we were young, we call it dialectic. So there's a dialectical counter here where people are yearning for something, you know, aggregator, some, some, something that, that places order and structure on millions of pieces of information. My conclusion is that um, that's the new, uh, one of the new functions or, or, or unique selling points of what we do, I mean, we are on the, we are on the net too, that would be curate. Okay, that's a, the fashionable new term, we curate. And um, that to me is my, my greatest hope. And it tells, if you look at the rising numbers of very serious pub, uh, publications, Economist, New York Times, I, I don't know what the numbers for, for Argus are. It, it, it's, it seems to, to affirm my point. The more stuff there is out there, the more you need somebody to serve it up for you and put it so it fits on your plate rather than overwhelming your brain. Right. I, I must mention that, on, on the other hand, uh, right-wing journalism or media is rising as well. So there's kind of a separation. More and more yeah. people read the New York Very Times good. from important. this point of view and more and more watching yeah. uh, Fox News because that's their point of view. And then there's this divide, right? Yeah. There's no more mainstream so much. Yeah. Um, the... This is true, and we call this the echo chamber. And we, we observe how people are separating into those, those echo chambers that you just mentioned. But if I go back to the history of journalism, say, go back to Israel in the 50s, 60s, 70s, which is the case for the, for the West too, uh, they, they were divided audiences. I mean, every little party had its own newspaper. Right. And if you go to the in Europe, Europe. The Europe, you had the parties that you had the churches, uh, you had powerful associations. So the the separation of audiences were we read only what say the publication of our club uh, is not is not a new thing. Um, the what we used to have, on the other hand, let me reverse myself again. We used to have kind of a national conversation in the early days of television. Go back to Israel again, it's true for other countries too. How many TV stations did you have in Israel too? Always going up and down. 
No, no, I'm talking about when, it's, when, when TV started. When, when TV started, Israel had one channel for over 20 years. Same in Germany. Then you had two. They were more or less governmental. Right. Or less. Right. Um, Britain obviously had the BBC. The Americans had the three networks. Do you still remember these names, ABC, NBC? Yeah, they're still there. They're still there. And CBS, yeah, but, they're still there. Look, when it's I was not what like, it used to be by far. When I used to be, when I was a, a student in the United States, it was part of our ritual was to sit down at 6.30 and watch the right. evening news. I'm sure the same thing was true in Israel. So end, to end this, to get to the point here is, that newspapers in some respect do still provide a table around which we can gather. That's the best I can tell you. Uh, I'd like to finish with uh, perhaps a message to uh, young journalists. What would be your message to them? What, I mean, there are two messages here. What I would want them to be and what is what the market is like in which they will flourish. What I would like them to be is easy. It's the classic. It's uh, get the facts. Don't be biased. Don't, don't think that journalism is agitprop, that you have to serve a particular ideological purpose, by the way, which has become very widespread throughout the Western world. So, so this, is, um, this runs against the very grain. We are supposed to report the news, explain it, but not to make the news and not to serve a particular ideological purpose. That's the one, one, one point. The other point is, <laughs> if the other point requires more cynicism, this is what will make you get ahead. And I think there, again, the entire Western world from you know, Tel Aviv to, to, uh, to Berlin, uh, and across, of course, the United States, to, to, to North America. Um, success now has become, um, the, the mark of success has become what uh, in German we call the good story. It is highly personalized. It's very colorful. It, it, it psychologizes. It tries to interpret when, uh, you know, Mrs. Merkel, in our case, you know, scratches her left eyebrow. What does that mean? It has enormous input. You know that kind of thing. It's psychologizing and um, and storytelling and personalizing them. Uh, so, if somebody asks me, "How do I get ahead?" I said, "I don't like it, unfortunately, but that's how you'll get ahead." So, two different answers. What should be an what is 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 good for them for the market and your position in it? Uh, Dr. Joseph Joffen, uh, publisher editor of Bitside. I thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Au revoir. Shalom. Mm -hmm.